Good morning and welcome to the second webinar in Solar Financing for Congregations. My name is Alice Ruffel and I've met some of you. I'm the Southern California Program Director for California Interfaith Power and Light. And it's been really great to see the increased interest and in action from the faith community all over California in terms of solar energy. And because of companies like Collective Sun, going solar is much more possible for congregations. So many of you are familiar with the work of California Interfaith Power and Light. In short, we work with congregations of all major faiths to implement the shared principle of caring for all of creation. And CITL is one state affiliate of the National Interfaith Power and Light Network, and we just celebrated our 15th year anniversary. CITL has 670 members now in our state. We're always looking for more. And our network reaches an estimate 18,000 congregations nationwide. CITL provides resources and referrals on energy efficiency, renewable energy, education, and advocacy. And um, in terms of renewable energy, uh, CITL really is the leading faith organization in the state that provides information on solar energy to houses of worship in California. Here is one of my favorite pictures. It's a slide of my friend Swami Mahayogananda on the roof of the Vedanta Society in Hollywood. And the solar system that is shown is their second system. And they are now receiving 35 kilowatts of clean renewable energy enough to meet a substantial portion of the monastery and the temple's electricity requirements. So before I wrap up, two quick items. If your congregation is not already a member of CIPL, we would love to have you be a member of CIPL. It's free and you'll receive very practical resources and it would plug you into a growing community of congregations that are taking a stand to care for and protect creation. All you have to do is go to interfaithpower.org and click on the Join Us button. And second, CIPL just released its new updated version of the Energy Efficiency and Solar Resource Guide. And Will and I will be happy to email you, um, all the participants on this webinar, um, a copy of this. So look for that in your email. And if you have any questions, just contact me. I am more than happy to discuss anything that you have on your mind. Uh, I'd like to point out this webinar will last a little bit less than an hour. Uh, we'll have the presentation first, and then at the conclusion, there will be an opportunity for question and answer. And if you look in your little box, you will be able to type a question in the question box. So as Todd is going through the presentation, please send me questions that you may have or questions that come up for you as we go through the question and answer session. So thanks again for being here. And I'd like to hand this over to Todd Blueshell. He's the VP of Marketing and Sales for Collective Sun. Thanks, Alice. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, like Alice said, my name is Todd Blueshell and I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing for Collective Sun. And joining me is Lee Barkin, our Chief Community Officer. So, who is Collective Sun? Well, we are an impact investing platform that facilitates loans between nonprofits and community members. Collective Sun is unique in that we are the only company in America that exclusively helps nonprofits get solar. And what this means for you in practical terms is that we understand all the financing challenges nonprofits face every day. And we've designed a platform around making solar as easy and inexpensive as possible. Historically, nonprofits have had two main challenges that prevented their ability to finance solar projects. First, nonprofits are excluded from utilizing tax benefits because they have no tax liability due to their 501c3 status. But working with Collective Sun, we can apply those tax credits to reduce the cost of your solar system. Second, nonprofits don't always have reserves robust enough to pay for solar. 
So Collective Sun created a proprietary crowd lending campaign that facilitates loans directly from community members to pay for solar. These loans are repaid with interest using the savings from the solar project. Collective Sun's crowd lending campaigns are different from donations because they do not require the nonprofit leaders to go to his or her supporters with their hands out yet again asking for another round of donations. Instead, they are able to offer an investment. Additionally, when a person makes a donation, they are only receiving a write-off. But with a crowd lending investment, there's an intrinsic benefit because these investors feel a sense of ownership and pride each and every time they see the solar panels on the roof of the nonprofit or church they love and support. So there are basically two ways to look at solar. Option one, solar is a service, whereby the nonprofit does not own the solar system. When solar is a service, the nonprofit receives the following, 24-hour monitoring of the system to make sure it's operating efficiently, all maintenance and repair are included. In 10 years, when the inverters typically go bad, yours will be replaced for free. Insurance, product, and install warranties, they're all included. But let's not forget about the tax credits, because they can be applied if solar is utilized as a service. But if you pay cash for and purchase a solar system as a product, you're going to lose those tax credits. When it's all said and done, solar as a service is substantially easier and substantially less expensive than the alternative, which is solar as a product. In this option, the nonprofit owns the solar system. Oh, sorry, I was muted there for a second. So in this option, in option muted, the only the only benefit is that the ownerships is that you inherit all the work and headache associated with the ownership of any unmuted your nonprofit will be responsible for everything and the overall cost will be more expensive collective sun provides solar as a service in the form of a ppa a prepaid ppa that is the prepaid ppa is funded by supporters of the nonprofit who are repaid with annual principal and interest payments under a prepaid PPA, nonprofits receive solar power not only at a substantially discounted rate from what they are currently paying, but this new rate will be locked in for 20 years. Our industry relationships and market insight allow Collective Sun to offer your nonprofit the lowest possible rate. In fact, Collective Sun rates are typically 40, 50 to 75 percent lower than traditional utility rates. Collective Sun does all the work for you. When purchasing solar as a service, you won't have to worry about choosing a reputable installer, quality equipment, or any of the frustrations associated when purchasing solar as a product. It's important to mention that solar, that Collective Sun contracts do not include any escalators, because escalators are a financial variable others use to make their contracts look less expensive in the short term, but in the long term, they're significantly much more expensive, and they hurt the savings of the nonprofit. Another way of looking at it, solar as a service is similar to a car service that allows you to enjoy the, the ride without worrying about any of the troubles associated with ownership of the car. But in contrast, when you own the car, you must pay for the gas, the tires need to be replaced, tune-ups every six months, the timing belt, et cetera, et cetera. Another distinction between Collective Sun and the outdated and more expensive funding options has to do with the difference between PPA types. Collective Sun offers prepaid PPAs funded by crowd lending campaigns that borrow money from community supporters to fund a loan that pays for the prepaid PPA. Traditional PPAs are funded by large bank, Wall Street investors, or some other unaffiliated entity. Prepaid PPAs have significantly lower interest rates when compared to traditional PPA rates. In fact, if the nonprofit wants, Collective Sun can even offer a 0% interest rate. But typically, we found supporters favor a 4-5% interest rate. Traditional PPAs are more expensive because banks view nonprofits as high-risk investments, so banks expect a higher interest rate. Loans on prepaid PPAs are paid back annually with interest to community members.
But with traditional PPAs, loans are paid back to the banks. With prepaid PPAs, profits from the loans stay in the community. But with a traditional PPA, loans leave the community. So, thank you Bob for that great overview. This is Lee. And I want to talk a little bit more about this concept of making a loan versus making a donation and how to engage your community. So I know it sounds obvious, you know, a loan is repaid with interest and donations not repaid, but there's really a lot more rich complexity to that conversation. So CollectorSun operates in this impact investment space. Yes, it's, uh, you know, a loan pays back with interest, but it's also a form of philanthropy because the people who are making the loans are benefiting a nonprofit that they care about. So the ask is very different. We intentionally ask for these loans instead of donations because, let's face it, if you went out and asked for donations for your solar system, it's just going to hurt other kinds of donation-based campaigns that you have ongoing all the time. But if you go out and ask for an investment or a loan that repays with interest, it's really a different part of the family budget, and we compete with other things like bank CDs or savings accounts or real estate or the stock market, which has seen all these crazy fluctuations. And people really appreciate the idea of being able to support a nonprofit they care about and uh, at the same time earn, earn a modest rate of return. Um, so, Todd, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, and Todd, can I interrupt you for a moment? This is Alice. Um, can you confirm again what PPA stands for and another quick um, uh, basic definition, um, an easier definition of PPA, Power Purchase Agreement? Lee, did you oh, want to? Sure, sure. I thought you said Todd. Uh, oh, this, is, this is Lee again. Uh, so sure, a power purchase agreement is just an agreement to buy electrons as a service. So it's kind of like buying the milk instead of the cow. And the reason you buy the milk instead of the cow is because somebody else can depreciate the cow and claim the tax benefits and then sell you cheaper milk. The other benefit for nonprofits is that you don't have to take care of the cow. Somebody else has the responsibility uh, for making sure it's maintained. Uh, you just get to enjoy the milk or the less expensive uh, kilowatt hour uh, power that's generated. Does that help answer that question, Alice? I think so, yeah. Sure. Great. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, the annual giving campaign that we include in all of our projects. So we go to the community and ask for loans, and those loans are repaid with annual principal and interest payments. But one thing that we do that's really unique is that we think a really good time to ask for donations is when you're giving somebody money. So we couple the notification of the annual principal and interest repayments with an opportunity to make a donation back to the nonprofit that you care about. So individuals will be notified they're going to receive a certain amount of uh, funds, how much interest that they've earned, and they have an option to donate all or a portion back to the nonprofit they care about. So it's a great way for nonprofits to almost kind of double dip. Uh, for, for those folks who are charitably minded, they may choose to make a donation back. And for those who aren't, that's okay. The nonprofit still benefits from the low cost power the, that and the savings. Um, Todd, next slide. <coughs> So you might be wondering, well, do I have, do I have time uh, to raise all these investments and uh, run this campaign? And, and that's the great news. So we give you the gift of time. We assign a dedicated campaign manager to your project who effectively will help you run the entire campaign. And we're fully committed to your success. We don't charge anything for this fund, fund man, for the campaign manager. <clears throat> And we're only successful if you're successful. So we are completely in alignment with our goals for the campaign. And let's talk a little bit about what that campaign manager is going to do on the next slide. Thanks, Todd. So you see here a, a big list of all the different items that we provide, all the communications, the online tools, the materials, 
The campaign manager provides expertise, best practices, support, <coughs> and a customized playbook with step-by-step -step instructions based on the needs of your particular nonprofit. So we understand that every nonprofit's unique. We customize the campaign for your particular community. And then there'll be weekly meetings with the campaign manager throughout the campaign to ensure its success. Todd? Yeah, and so we just wanted to real quickly go over a couple of the projects uh, that we've recently done. Uh, first is the First Southern Baptist Church was a project we recently did in Yucca Valley. Um, this church is going to save over $87,000. Uh, a church in Brea, um, which is in Orange County, kind of near Los Angeles, and they're going to save over $100,000 on their project. Then we have the spiritual, uh, the Brea Church, uh, I'm sorry, Brea Congressional United Church of Christ was a project we recently did in Orange County. Uh, that's one Lee just already said. <laughs> and then the uh, Center for Spiritual Living in San Jose. Uh, another project with $272,000 of energy savings over the life of the project. And then lastly is the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a project we recently did in Colorado, and it's one we're actually particularly proud of because the Rocky Mountain Institute, they're an organization dedicated to research, publication, consulting, uh, in, this, in the field of uh, sustainability. I mean, I mean, these guys know everything about uh, energy uh, resource efficiency. and. Being chosen chosen to fund their solar project uh, was not only a big honor for a collective sum, but I think more importantly, it, it kind of gives a sense of, it's a wonderful indicator of how innovative and beneficial what it is we're trying to help the nonprofits and churches offer uh, insofar as getting solar uh, for their systems. And then lastly, I wanted to quickly mention some of the types of nonprofits that uh, Collective Sun works with. In addition to churches, we also work with the synagogues, basically all, all faith-based organizations, schools, transitional housing, homeless shelters, arts and culture organizations, fundraising organizations, environmental, veterans, animal shelters, food banks, basically any and all nonprofits. So anyways, I realize we've gone over a lot of information in kind of a quick manner, but we did so because we wanted to keep as much time as possible towards the end to answer some of the questions. Uh, questions that might have come up. Alice, did we get any questions from the, from the presentation? We did. We did. And also, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, give you a, an example of a church. Let's uh, put a little scenario together. Let's say that there is um, a congregation, a Jewish congregation in Los Angeles that wants to go solar. And um, you come out and you say, well, you know what, um, we're thinking maybe a 30 kilowatt here. Walk again through your process of what would happen, um, what would be the first step that you would take for this. So go over your process just one more time, kind of basically. Okay. Where the money would come from, how it's raised, all that stuff. Lee, do you want me to, or do you want to take it? Sure, go ahead, Todd. So what basically happens, like you said, Alice, is if there is a church or nonprofit that is interested in solar, great. They give me a call. I go over kind of what it is they're looking for. And then the first requirement is I need to understand what their current energy use is. And so to do that, uh, there's a thing called green button data. Uh, there's a little meter on every building. Some buildings have several meters. But they send information back to the utility company every 15 minutes. Over the course of a year, that 15 minutes uh, information, I can use all that data to assimilate exactly what each building needs, what their solar energies need are, and then I can build the most optimal solar system to, to satisfy their needs. Once I learn that system, I can go into the satellite pictures and do a bunch of other calculations with my engineers, and then we're going to put together a free proposal for each one of these uh, nonprofits. That, in that proposal, it's going to show you your current energy usage, your savings, the savings you'll you'll save over the course of the 20-year term of the PPA. It's just a great tool that we offer for free to anybody who's interested um, to show them how solar actually can benefit them. Once they see the benefits, if it's something they still want to proceed with, then we'll explain to them our crowd lending campaign, how that works, how we basically assign a manager to them, how that campaign manager works with the church. Usually there's a solar team that's working with. We, 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 we work with them on a pre-campaign. Uh, from day one, we talk to them. It's basically a guideline, like a 25-page book 
guideline on how to fund it. Those campaigns, uh, we found through studies that they, we prefer a 40-day campaign, but in reality, Alice, most of the people either fund the first week or the last week. It's just the nature of human, human, humans. <laughs> we either do it right up front or we wait to the end. Um, we did have one, uh, I, think it, I think it was Braille, that actually funded in less than two weeks. We've had ones that have funded on the first day with uh, a couple of really uh, charitable people who just wrote a check the first day. So it really depends. That kind of answer your question, the process? Sure. And every nonprofit and, um, is a little bit different. Right. And as we mentioned, we only work with nonprofits, so we certainly understand the, the uniquenesses of every uh, community. Right. Good. Okay. Uh, we got a couple questions. First of all, you had mentioned PACE. What does PACE stand for, and what does it do? And how can congregations find out more information? Sure. So PACE is unrelated to our offering. PACE stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. And that's basically a loan from a bank that is secured by your property. The problem with PACE is it does nothing for tax benefits. So unfortunately, even with a PACE loan, it's still similar to doing a cash purchase. You end up owning um, um, all of the headaches involved with the system, and you miss out on the tax benefits. So a third-party bank basically is funding the loan, and the way they get comfortable with the nonprofit is they attach to your building. So if you don't pay them back, they take your building away. And that's very different than the way we operate. We're going to the community members, not to the bank. And so our interest rates are going to be lower, and our terms are going to be a lot more favorable. We don't attach to any real estate. It's a, it's a simple, unsecured note to the nonprofit that we facilitate between community members and the nonprofit itself. Yeah, let me just chime in on that real quick, Alice. I think Lee's hit a really important nerve here, and that is simplicity. Um, nonprofits have a very challenging time getting money from banks. I mean, churches, even, I mean, the smaller the nonprofit, the more challenged, I'm sure they understand is It's very difficult to go to a bank and try even to get a loan to pay for solar. I mean, they're just deemed high risk. So that's one of the reasons why we go directly, uh, directly to the supporters. They they're the ones that are in, uh, taking on that risk, and, and they're willing to accept a lower interest rate for that. And there's really no magic, and there shouldn't be any surprise to any of our listeners about how this works. If you're yeah. going to a bank, and a bank hears the word nonprofit, and they assume high risk, and they extract a higher interest rate, when you look at a traditional PPA or any kind of financing, they hide or they bury what the imputed interest rate really is. What we do is go to the community and we establish a loan between community members and the nonprofit. And at four or five percent, well, that's much lower than what the bank is extracting through a traditional PPA, which are often in the high, you know, uh, teens, double digit numbers. So when you swap out expensive interest for less expensive interest, then it's really simple to understand why our PPA rates are so much lower than traditional PPAs because they're funded by community members. And we want the community members to benefit from the loan. I mean, someone's going to benefit from from this transaction. We we believe it should be the supporters of the nonprofit that should get that benefit, not the you know, the, the people who run the banks. Okay, uh, we have about uh, twelve questions. Some are quick. Um, Joseph says. Um, he wants to make um, the clarification with what you are. Collective Sun is almost like a utility company, except you're not, like for me, um, we wouldn't be getting energy from Pasadena Water and Power, for example. We would actually be using you kind of as our utility company, right? So we would pay for the energy that we use, but it's less expensive and cleaner than the utilities power because it's solar, right? So you're kind of like the utility company in a way. That's effectively true. You stay interconnected with the grid. Now, PPA providers aren't classified as utility companies, but you can think of it as a company that's owning and operating this solar project on your roof that's selling you discount power at a discount to what the utility would normally charge. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Um, okay. And uh, in the slide where you pointed out how much money that has been saved by those three congregations, was that over the life of the system, like 20 years, or was that every year, or what period was that? 
Oh, that that was over the the PPA period, the twenty years. But that was even after paying back all of the interest and principal back to the community members. So we've seen in in all cases that there's there's some portion that that is donated back to the to the nonprofit. That that assumes that there isn't any portion that's donated back, even if nobody was charitably minded and just kept their full principal and interest payments. They they still would see substantial savings. Mm. And and it's and it's true that some people actually donate back uh, their their principal or their interest savings. Correct. Correct. Okay. Great. Okay. The next one is. Um, Someone asked about, do you have a contact at the Rocky Mountain Institute? But I think that we can get in touch with Eric in particular from that. Um, OK, what are the fees for working through collective fund? Is there a minimum project size? I believe the minimum project size was 20 kilowatts. And then what are the fees for working through collective fund? Um, so all of our fees are going to be inclusive in the proposal that we share uh, after we get all of your green green button data and uh, information about the project. Um, so even if you were to incorporate, you know, the fees that we charge for our activities, since we're able to use the 30% tax credit, you're still paying less than if you were to go out and purchase the solar system directly and lose all of those tax benefits. Um, but the fees do vary based on the project and and, and the, the, the kind of project and the, the work that's involved. So each project's a little bit different, but we're happy to talk to you about your individual um, project situations. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Right. When, that's what I was saying when there is a nonprofit that is interested, it's best to just give me a call. I'll go through the particulars with you. And yes, you were correct. The, the minimum for basically our size to pay back so that we can apply the tax credits, that's 20%. We Great. still can work 20 KW. Uh, 20 KW, uh, my mistake. But yes, we still can work. Kilowatt. Yes. We can still work with nonprofits who have systems smaller than 20 KW. We just can't apply the tax credits. So we can basically, in essence, still facilitate a loan at that point to pay for a solar system, like a cash purchase. But it doesn't make sense from a, a a financial point of view to apply tax credits for anything other than 20 kW. Great. Okay, we have a gentleman, Joseph again. He's very involved in this because he's with a solar installation company up in New Mexico. He says that you mentioned you do all the sourcing. He is with a solar installation company in New Mexico. How does his solar installation company get involved with the program? And he says that he has several uh, congregations in his area that have come to us with this question. Well, first of all, hi, Joseph. How are you doing? Thanks for your involvement. Uh, we do work with uh, a lot of installers nationwide. We are a nationwide company. Uh, we have basically a set of questions we ask and, and guidelines that we have them follow. Um, I want to be clear on the point that Collective Sun, we are not an installer. We are just, again, we're a financing model that helps nonprofits pay for solar projects. So we work with uh, installers nationwide. So Joseph, feel free to give me a call. The contact information is below. We can discuss any of the projects you want and see if, if there's a fit. And I, I want right. to add, add right. to that point as well that since we're not the installer, we don't really have a dog in that fight, so to speak. So we can help the nonprofit in something of an advisory capacity since we have an awful lot of market intelligence. We see bids all day long. We can help identify, you know, what we observe as good pricing or uh, less aggressive pricing, more aggressive pricing, and um, be supportive in, in, in that conversation. So we like to see a robust competitive bidding process. If you have installers you already prefer and work with, great, let's add them to that process. If you don't, that's okay. We can help by identify them. But we're really going to help you through the process, and, and because we have that independence, uh, we're, we're, we can be a very good resource uh, in, in the process. Yeah, it's also really right. important to mention, Alice, that we are only working for the nonprofit. Uh, and, I, and what that means is that we're looking for the best interest. We want the nonprofit to get the best deal. It's why I said we don't care about the interest rate. In fact, we almost prefer that nonprofits utilize a 0% interest rate because that is going to mean less money that they're going to have to pay back. So it's just I just wanted to make that point clear that when we're looking at installers, when we're looking at the project, when we're looking at what even what product solar panels are going on the roof. 
we're going to design a system and create a, a, a financial model that's going to be in the very best interest with a specific nonprofit that we're helping out. Yeah, and just to add some color to that again, from our perspective, it could be zero percent, it could be ten percent. We're we're going to work with you based on conversations with your community to understand where that um, attractiveness level is. We generally find four to five percent uh, for a ten-year, twelve-year note seems to be where there's market interest. Because hey, that's more than folks are earning in a savings account in a bank, and uh, they're they're very comfortable with, with that. Um, and you know, we we can help identify based on your particular community and and your needs where where that right sweet spot is based on all of our experience running multiple campaigns. Great. Okay. Um, oh, um, here's a question. What if my electric company does not provide? It says five minute, but I think they mean fifteen minute load data. Right. Can you get what you need? Can you get the information you need? Yeah, and and you'll notice, uh, you know, not not all installers are going to ask you for this information. We're asking for this information because we're trying to be as accurate as possible. We have very sophisticated financial modeling tools and a deep bench of engineering talent that can help identify what the what the appropriate system size is based on your utility rate tariffs and structures for your particular area. And, um, you know, also the savings that we can expect based on your, again, your particular tariff. So without getting into too much complexity, co contact us offline. We can, we can share more information. But if you don't have the, the granular usage data, we can make estimates, right? We can use estimates and, um, and, and provide as much uh, detail and as accurate of a, of a savings estimate as we can based on whatever information is available. Uh, next question, um, very general, do you hire any local people? You know, that, that's a great, great question, uh, and that has come up before on one of our, our projects. I, I mentioned that we don't really have a dog in the fight with installers, and, and that's true. We like to see the lowest cost for energy, period. And so in every case, we've always had our, our recommendation accepted by the nonprofit for um, – you know the the installer with the lowest cost, best least cost, best fit, and and so on, except for one. And it was in in one project where the nonprofit specifically wanted an installer who was local to them, and we found an installer who was local, but that particular installer was more expensive. It was a small community, and we built the financial models and showed them how it was going to unfortunately erode some of their savings, and they said that's okay. We still want to choose the local installer, even though we realize we're going to be spending a little bit more. And we said, great, we want to support you. Um, nonprofit preferences are always going to be respected. We just want to make sure that you're doing it with all the information so you know what the cost is. And if you see that a cost for a particular preference is different and you accept that cost and, and acknowledge it, and, and that's what you want to do to move forward, and that, and that's what we're going to support. Right. All right. There are um, a lot more questions, and some of them can be put together. Um, one of them is, um, let's see. Okay. Um, one of them is um, the question of, what if a congregation does this and get solar placed, and in a few years they need to move to another location? What happens to the system and the building? Now think of that um, with the question of, does the organization or the nonprofit, the congregation, own the installation at the end of your contract without added cost? Sure. So what if they move is one, and then... Uh, at the end of the contract, contract, do they just own it outright without added cost? Sure. So under a prepaid PPA, you're paying in advance for 20 years' worth of power, and then you're financing that prepayment utilizing loans from community members. So the nonprofit doesn't actually pay anything out of pocket. They're paying over time to repay these loans to community members. So if they move for whatever reason, there's still an obligation by the provider to deliver these 20 years' worth of power. So the way that you could 
simply you know mitigate that is the next owner of the building you could add to the purchase price the value of all the energy that's going to be delivered and then um, you know, I could use that to repay the community members. Now, keep in mind, the loan may have already been paid off. It's only a 10, sometimes 12-year loan. And remember that you're getting power for 20 years, including all the monitoring, operations, maintenance, repairs. So if at some point in the future the loan's already paid off, and you can pay it off early too if you'd like, uh, then you just, you know, are delivering a building that's extraordinarily valuable because it comes with all this free power for a future period of time. Now, at the end of the PPA term, it's just like every other PPA you're going to find in the marketplace. So PPAs, by definition, are always going to have three options. And, and this isn't because the, the providers think this is a particularly great way to do it. It's because the IRS rules around what's going to be respected as a service contract as opposed to a sale of an asset. So at the end of the term for the PPA, you're going to have an option to either continue at the same PPA rate if you like the service model. You could do a purchase option if you wanted to own it, or you could say, I'm done, and the provider has to come and remove the equipment from your roof, and at that time, 20 years from now, depending on what technology is available and what utility rate tariff structures look like, uh, you know, you could potentially move into a new technology or, or a new structure. Giving the nonprofit all three options puts them in the best position because they have all the leverage in the transactions. Providers actually don't like this. Uh, I'm sure they would much rather just have the asset automatically transfer, but the IRS wouldn't allow that in any case. It would no longer be considered a service contract, and the IRS would call it a disguise sale and claw back all the tax benefits. And also, I want to make a point on uh, something that Lee kind of brushed over, and I don't think we've discussed it all, and that is utility rates... I don't, a lot of people, they're all, I believe they're always going to go up. And one of the benefits of locking in a discounted energy rate today is the fact that that discounted rate today is going to stay the same for the course of the 20-year period. But at the end of 20 years, our, our numbers that we put into our proposals are very, very conservative. The saving estimates, you know, uh, I was talking earlier about the escalators. It's a wonderful being able to lock in because it gives you a lot of certainty in so far as forecasting your models. Uh, people like Lee who love to play with numbers, the accountants, they love being able to understand how much energy I'm going to have to spend, you know, how much it's going to cost me. And, and being able to have that known, that certainty for the course of 20 years, a lot of people, like my buddy Lee, they love that stuff. Yes, I, I'm the proud CPA on the webinar today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, where does your collateral come from? Internally, internally developed. So, so we have a campaign manager that is going to work with your team to understand the culture, the community, the communication assets, and then we're going to custom build uh, collateral material for uh, every one of the campaigns as part of a full campaign uh, playbook, uh, more than 25 pages worth of information and step-by-step -step instructions. Okay, I have one question here. Um, I'm going to interpret it a little bit. The question is, do you put a UCC1 lien on the property? I think that means that if a property defaults in its payment or something, is a lien put on the property? No, we, we have the, the, the easiest, most nonprofit friendly loans in, in the world because because we're writing, you know, they're, they're, they're really between the community members and the nonprofit itself. So they're structured as an unsecured note, which community members are very comfortable with. Um, it, it's it's about as simple as it gets. It's very different than any other kind of funding out there because it's written to be friendly to the nonprofit. Actually, I love that question, Alice, because it's kind of comical for me. You know, I feel most of the initial intake calls from people, and they just have a hard time understanding how can this be so easy. And I, and I feel like I have to sell something simple. People want they're so used to dealing with banks and the complexities and the forms and the I have to wait till you're approved and all these these serious hurdles that they have to overcome when they hear a process that's so relatively easy. I, I literally have what I had one person just say, "This is too is too easy. It's too simple. There's no way this can be true. I don't believe it." He hung up on me. I mean, but it's true, and I wish there was something, some way that I could prove it's true. It's easy. <laughs> and I think part of that is really coming from our our culture. You know, each of us we serve on non by Start on nonprofit boards ourselves. Todd has started his own charity. Uh, my dad's founded his own. Um, 
a research foundation, nonprofit. I mean, it's kind of culturally where we approach this transaction is through being a supporter, supporters of nonprofits ourselves, and seeing how nonprofits unfortunately get hurt by being nonprofits because we've chosen to incentivize renewables through the tax code, and you know that that to us is a real injustice that nonprofits get hurt that way, and so we believe that by harnessing the strength of the nonprofit community itself, you know, we can overcome these challenges. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I have two questions rolled into one. Uh, the one is from my friend Bill Raddis, who's a Reverend uh, First Lutheran Church in San Diego. And actually, Lee Barkin is going to be present at an event in San Diego that we're giving next Friday, April 15th. So if you're in San Diego, Come to St. Paul's Cathedral and send information out. Okay, so the two questions are very similar. Bill writes it as, can you give an example of what a cost was for a church to enter into a collective fund deal? And the same question is formulated by Mary Doyle as, will you give an example of cost up front and each year as well as the investment return? Now, of course, it it, it, it's individualized, but I think they're looking just for some, like, estimates. Lee holds those numbers in his head. So yeah, it's, sure it's, it really is so specific to each project, and we've seen variability in different parts of the country. Ultimately, it's going to be a factor of the dollar per watt that the installer is charging, and it's going to be a factor of the production, what we measure in the KWH per KW, which is going to drive kind of the efficiency number how many kilowatt hours a particular panel is going to generate. If you take the same panel and you hold it over your head, uh, which I, I don't recommend doing on a rooftop, but just imagine the visual, uh, and you hold that panel in San Diego, it's going to generate a different amount of, the exact same panel is going to generate a different amount of power than holding it over your head on a rooftop in Alaska. So that's why, you know, we, we don't want to, um, you know, be, be too broad but we can very easily work up the specifics for your project. If you have an installer bid already, that's great. That, that'll help expedite the process. But what I can tell you is it, it's always going to be less expensive. It's always going to be a discount to the purchase price. So either you, know, you, you can pay more uh, and, then not, and then not get all the benefits of the monitoring operations and maintenance or pay less and get free monitoring operations, maintenance, and repairs. And it seems a little counterintuitive, but when you look under the hood, it's just the tax benefits. When you have a way to access the tax benefits, then all of a sudden it's actually less expensive to buy electrons as a service than to go out and write a check and buy equipment directly from the installer themselves. And also, there's a really, really simple way to summarize everything from a consumer's point of view when you're looking at solar. And that is you're always going to want to look at just one number, one singular number, and that's the LCOE, the lowest cost of energy. You're going to always want to try and find, over the course of the 20-year period, what, what's going to be my least expensive energy. You just extrapolate it over the, over the course of 20 years. And if my energy, collective sun's energy, is going to be less expensive than some guys, someone else's energy, it's really simple how you choose. But a lot of people get caught up in all these little details and and I think it's great that they want to understand the system, but they're really, you know, you're you're trying to save money, and LCOE is going to allow you to do that. Let me let me add some color to that too. It's a really important point, Todd. Thanks for bringing that up. The the levelized cost of energy or the LCOE is just a simple cents per kilowatt hour rate. And when you're looking at solar, there's so many variables. What kind of panels do we use? What kind of installer do we choose? Inverters and at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters in a service contract is what is the rate that we're paying for power. All those actually other things actually don't, you know, play a factor. So the only number you have to consider is the LCOE. And I know this gets a little bit technical, but let's talk about that for a minute and how you calculate it. The LCOE is just the dollars going out divided by the kilowatt hours coming in. It's really that simple. If you're spending, you know, writing a check for X dollars and then you're receiving a certain number of kilowatt hours, you divide them, you're going to get a number, you know, whether it's 8 cents, 12 cents, 18 cents, 20 cents, whatever the number is. It's a certain number of cents per kilowatt hour. That number isn't going to change. And you're going to get all of the maintenance operations, monitoring, repairs, all of that included, no extra costs. 
So when you're comparing, instead of looking at savings numbers, which are a great unknown and are often inflated by installers, just look at the cost numbers because those are certain. Those are some, That's something you know. It's not dependent upon somebody's estimate of future utility rate escalations and a bunch of complex variables that, frankly, and candidly, we often see manipulated. So when you're looking at you know two different proposals, if one says I'm going to save a million dollars and one says I'm going to save two million dollars, it's probably the wrong thing to be looking at because if you dig deeper, you'll discover that they're probably the same, but one installer has chosen to use a higher estimate for the rate that power bills are going to go up in the future. So savings numbers... That's, might, the, that's, the, estimator. that's the estimator. Yeah, uh, but the, the savings numbers are by definition based on variables that are unknown, whereas the cost numbers are always going to be known. So the only thing you really have to look at is the LCOE. If we can buy power for 15 cents and we're currently paying 20 cents, then you want to buy that power all day long because it's going to be cheaper. Great. And also, I want to confirm with um, everyone on the call that if you have more questions, you can call Todd or Lee. Um, they're not going to pressure you. You can just make like an innocent call. Sometimes we don't even want to call solar installers, and that's why we have these webinars to introduce you to people so that you don't have to like be afraid of picking up the phone. I mean, you can you can call them for an individualized quote, and you do not have to go with them. But but if you have more information, you can definitely call them. Okay, um, I have a question from Abbas. Most PPAs are typically signed for large, like one megawatt systems, but you said your minimum is 20 kilowatt. Um, his building needs only 15 to 20 kilowatt system. The local company will not sign a PPA for a small system. How can I work with you? And I wish I knew which the local company was. Um, for example, congregations in LADWP won't sign for PPAs. But how could a local uh, company, um, uh, or how, how could this happen? How could this person work with you? if the local company does not sign for PPA for small systems? Well, it depends if their local company he's talking about is the installer or if it's the utility. Because we often find installers don't, you know, don't, don't want to bother with smaller systems in general, mm -hmm. uh, which we're comfortable with. We understand nonprofits, this is kind of their, their area. So we're quite happy to, to work with you for systems of any size. Our minimums for doing a tax advantaged uh, PPA is going to be 20 kW, but even if it's smaller, um, you know there, there's still options that we can do without the tax benefits, utilizing the crowd lending campaigns. Okay, all right. Um, if the building roof is not good, and this is a very important because you have to make sure that you have a good structured roof. If the building roof is not good, will you do ground mounts? Yes. Uh, in fact, we will help evaluate uh, the cost effectiveness of doing ground mounts, uh, shade support structures, sometimes called carports, or doing something on the roof. Okay. All right. Two questions having to do with New Mexico. One, are there tax benefits? Are the tax benefits valid for New Mexico? Okay, that's one question. Yes. And the second part to that is, have you done any installs in New Mexico com uh, complied with NMCID, which is New Mexico something, I don't know. It yeah. might be a, a local utility. Yeah, so short answer is that it's a federal tax credit, so it's good and valid in all 50 states. and. Um, there are utility service territories across the country, literally 4,000 of them. We have experience in many. Uh, our, our software can import from uh, utility territories all across the country, so it wouldn't be a problem to add the specific ones in New Mexico to do the full analysis, and very happy to talk to you about opportunities there. Ultimately, it's always going to come down to the cost savings, the utility avoided cost, or how much you're currently paying the utility is you know, going to be the, the water level mark, and then the cost of the installation. So how robust of an installer community there is, how much competition in order to drive costs lower. And, and somewhere there, there has to be you know, a, a 
a cost number that makes sense uh, relative to an avoided cost so that there is savings for the nonprofit. Yeah, basically, Alice, what, what Lee's saying is that every project is different. We just need to talk to them. We need to understand what the particulars are, plug into our little formulas and computers, our engineers. We're going to plug out a number. If we can save them a big amount of money, great. If we can save them a little amount of money, great. I mean, some we save, you know, huge sums, but it just varies project to project. Great. Okay, and I want to do a time yeah. check. We have about eight minutes okay. left, and we have about seven more questions. But, yeah, I also please. want to add really, really quickly that PPAs in general, it's not just the cost savings. What nonprofits really like about them is the predictability and certainty of locking in a rate. So if rates continue to go up, even if you locked in something at today's rate over a 20-year period, then there's certainly going to be savings. But what the nonprofits like about it is that from a budget perspective, they can lock in a particular number, and they're not at the mercy of rate escalations that wind up and down all over the place over a period of time. Great point. Great. Okay. What is the impact of the relationship between the federal tax credit a New Mexico state credit, which is due to expire at the end of 2016? Um, none. So so we're strictly looking at the federal tax credit, which we have a nice extension and a yep. runway for. So you, so you assist a congregation in applying for the federal tax credit, not local credits? We're, we're able uh, to monetize like the state. federal, correct, the federal tax credits. Great. All right, here's a question that I had as well. Um, can the congregation prepay uh, some of the cost early to own the system faster? So some of my congregations, for example, in Glendale, they did a PPA and they own the system in seven years instead of 20. So is it possible to put more up front and own the system faster? Um, absolutely, but there's, I think there's a couple questions embedded in there. So the prepay amount, it is possible to utilize some reserves to pay the prepayment in our 20-year prepaid PPA. Now, we happen to think reserves are great, um, and if you have the luxury of having substantial reserves, they're wonderful, um, but you may want to keep them for that rainy day. And even though you could do a portion from reserves, we think it makes the most sense to go to the community and, and raise uh, the full amount through a loan from community members because it's very it's very simple debt, low interest, and very friendly uh, from a, the terms are written extraordinarily friendly to the nonprofit. So yes, they could pay a portion from reserves, um, but you know that that would be really up to them uh, to do. As far as owning the system faster, um, that's that's another mistake we see nonprofits make all the time. It doesn't actually make financial sense. I realize there's an emotional component to ownership, but from a financial perspective, if somebody else has the liability of ownership, uh, they're paying the insurance, they're doing the monitoring, the operations, the maintenance, the repairs. If the installer goes out of business and they don't honor their workmanship warranty or the manufacturer becomes insolvent and they can't honor their warranty, somebody, you know, um, something breaks or there's vandalism or, or theft, uh, any of those issues, it's just not your headache. It's somebody else's problem. So it's always puzzled me a little bit that some nonprofits have thought, well, gee, I think I want to own it and uh, sooner rather than later. And, and that makes sense in a traditional sort of consumer mentality. I would absolutely agree if this was any other kind of asset. But solar is unique. Uh, solar, solar is special in the sense that you actually pay more to write a check and own it than you do by having the service because of the tax benefits and the way the structure is built. Yeah, it's actually why I put one slide dedicated just to the difference between ownership as a product versus a service because it's, it's one of the biggest challenges I have when discussing this with people. Uh, like Lee said, there just is this mindset that people think it's better to own something. And I get it. You want to own something. But in this particular case, you absolutely don't want to own it. It's going to be more expensive and you got to deal with all those headaches. It's that simple. Great. Okay, um, the question. A local congregation formed an LLC, a limited liability uh, corporation, to finance their solar system. Does Collective Sun can elect Collective Sun essentially help a congregation form its own LLC for their solar project? 
what is the legal structure arrangements with collective fund? Yeah, no, this is so much simpler than that. And, and we also see nonprofits who try the, the do-it-yourself approach with a separate entity structure. And contact me offline and I'll explain the details to you, but it is essentially adding an enormous volume of complexity and cost, uh, which you don't have any of those headaches with a straightforward prepaid PPA. And there's also mistakes that people make because they think they can pass the tax credits through to their community members, but you can't because typically someone's bought solar on their home, but that's covered under Section 25D of the tax code. Residential tax credits are different than commercial tax credits, and what you discover through the LLC is when you do the pass-through of the tax credit to community members, it cannot be used to offset ordinary income or portfolio income. Uh, there's a specific ban, so I, I'm sorry, I, I won't get into more complex details other than to okay. say, yes, yeah, stop me here, uh, you know, contact us and we'll explain the complexities. It's extraordinarily difficult, expensive, and not advisable. Our structure is extraordinarily simple. We won't make you form a separate LLC, deal with the K-1s or any of those headaches. This is a simple debt structure, uh, a promissory note uh, with simple interest payments. Let me just simplify Lee's answer. If you want to try it, it's going to cost you a lot more money, and it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, we, we, that's, that's why we designed our system the way it is. Great. Okay, I'm going to put the last question into two parts, and I'm going to confirm with everyone on the call that we will send you an email for everyone who signed up, and we will send you our energy efficiency guide, our newly replied re uh, revised energy efficiency guide and we'll send you the information the contact for Lee and Todd. Um, a couple people wanted the slides from this so um, if Todd can make that available we can send you the slides and also there will be a recording of this available as well. Okay so the last two before we go. One, what about building energy efficiency measures you know such as lighting, uh, HVAC, things like that. Um, do you provide any financing for those? And if not, can you um, give some guidance as to the best way to finance these? Energy efficiency, that's one. And the last one is, how do we know for sure that maintenance would be provided for 20 years? Could the, sh could the parish be left with those costs? Great. So let me tackle. Like, like what if Collective Sun went out of Co correct. business or something? No, that, that's a great question, and we do address that. We've gone to extraordinary lengths in order to isolate. You don't actually make the payment to Collective Sun. So Collective Sun could disappear. It wouldn't affect uh, any of those payments. The provider is set up in a separate LLC, which doesn't have employees or other typical business expenses. So the set aside for operations and maintenance is in a separate LLC so that if Collective Sun were to become insolvent for whatever reason, it would not impact that at all. So you should be very comfortable in knowing that the nonprofit is protected in any one of those scenarios. And I, I respect that, hey, you have to ask those kinds of tough, tough questions and, and we welcome them. Um, the second, uh, regarding energy efficiency, yeah, really glad you asked this question. So the short answer is yes, we could finance energy efficiency. In fact, we could finance other things as well. And we've had some nonprofits have approached us about utilizing the platform to finance other things. We think that going to the community for uh, offering loans for different things is a fantastic idea to uh, disintermediate the bank system in general. That crowd lending as a tool, going to your community and asking for a loan is a great mechanism to finance things uh, and it would work up for projects other than solar. It could work for energy efficiency could work for you know a new van uh, or for a new building. There's there's a lot of very interesting applications in how uh, the financial landscape is changing, uh, with people becoming less uh, trusting of Wall Street and more interested in keeping their dollars local and in the community, understanding where their investments are going and aligning those investments with their values is becoming more and more important in uh, in the new environment. So, yeah, we certainly welcome those conversations and, and happy to talk with you on an, uh, a one-on-one -on -one basis. Okay. I think that's it for right now. I think I've covered most of the questions. And as we said before, we'll get in touch with uh, all the attendees and send you a follow-up email. And in the 
uh, don't ever um, hesitate to contact CITL if you have further questions for the referrals and um, all of that good stuff. And thank you so much for everything that you're doing. And I hope you all do go solar. Alice, excellent job. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, everybody, for attending. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.